1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. This is the Apostle Paul that's writing the 1 Corinthians letter, and he's calling Christians to be a follower of him as much as he is a follower of Christ. So he's saying, I am your role model, you should follow me and see how I follow Christ and replicate that. But at the end of the day, we're called to follow Christ. Uh, Apostle Paul was really the apostle to the Gentiles, whereas Peter was the apostle to the Jews. So really, as Gentiles, you know, unbelievers that come to Christ, we should try to follow Paul as much as possible. And I believe that this is the reasons why um, Paul's writings are so often within the New Testament. You know, they take up the majority of the New Testament content. And it's because most people that follow Christ tend to be from the Gentiles since there's more of them than from the Jews. It's, you know, the Bible is very well balanced in that respect. So we should follow Paul in as much as he follows Christ. It says in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So it may be in Corinth that there may be some sort of misunderstanding that women are really the head of the household, and it may be that that was their culture, I'm unsure. But here we're told with the authority of scripture that really man is the head of the household. So what does that mean? Well, females are called to serve their husband like the church serves Christ. And the husband is told to love their wife like Christ loves the church. Both is immensely significant. But the thing here is that in the household, the man has the ultimate authority to be able to make decisions. But the man needs to be very wise, very wise because they are responsible for the family. So therefore, they need to love the family and make appropriate decisions in order not to jeopardize the future or to harm the family. They need to protect the family like God protects the church. So man loves his wife and takes good care of her, but the wife is submissive to the husband. So what does that look like? It doesn't look like us dominating our wife. It doesn't look like us turning our wives into slaves. It looks like us loving our wife, but when there is a conflict, it is ultimately the man that makes the end decision, but he does that in a God-fearing way, seeking to serve the Lord. But it is the truth that women really are uh, submissive to the husband and the husband takes a leadership role in the family. And if you don't agree with that as a Christian, the thing is, is that you need to repent of it because it is clearly laid out in scripture That's that's how it should be. And a lot of feminists will hate that, but the thing is, is that we're not called to live in a secular world as Christians. We're called to live under the authority of the word of God. So husbands, love your wives, you know, and <laughs> just love and take care of them and cherish them and don't rule over them. But women, understand that your husbands really have the authority over the household. It says in verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonor his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesy with her head uncovered, dishonor of her head for that is even or one as if she were shaven so women tend to look far more beautiful when they have long hair uh, but blokes we you know we tend to have our hair fall out so we tend to have our hair shaven like me for example I'm you know I'm blessed with boldness um, but women really they're called to have long hair because they just look more beautiful like that. Now that might be a personal opinion of mine, and and so it is. You know, I love long hair on a woman, but the truth is, is that this is also what scripture says. And it may have been a Jewish uh, tradition that women tend to have longer hair, and it may be that this has actually become a Christian tradition as well. Now you might say, as a female, well, I have a freedom in Christ, so therefore I'm going to keep my hair short and you know what fine 
uh, but I wouldn't say that you should really go bold because of the scripture here says that you shouldn't do that so short hair maybe but uh, we know that the glory of women is their long hair is what the scripture says and it says that really when women pray and prophesy they should have their head covered now this may be with some sort of um, scarf or soft fabric but blokes are supposed to have it uncovered and the reason why is because blokes tend to be more like the glory of God um, and women are really kind of like the glory of man they're, they're kind of uh, lesser in a sense of, of glory and this is what scripture re reveals to us it says in verse 7 for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God but the woman is the glory of man for the man is not the woman but the woman of the man neither the man created for the woman but the woman for the man so you know God created a helper for Adam in the beginning Eve and that's the thing the woman is really the helper to support the man uh, in order to move forward in the direction that the man takes now I personally feel that because I love my wife so much I'm actually moving in the same direction as what my wife wants we come to an agreement and uh, we move forward but I know that I'm still the head of the household and I like to think and I believe that it's true that God works with us cooperatively through partnership moving the church forward within the world and advancing the kingdom but he does it through our prayers and petitions and considers our prayer and petitions and answers prayer and petition you see God works with us and we can move God's direction as he listens to our pleas that we put before him in prayer otherwise I don't believe that prayer would there would be any point in it you know God does answer prayer and we see this within within scripture so you know Christ is above all but the man is above the woman and really the scriptures here are just laying out the way that it is and this is what we need to agree with because it is scripture now it says in verse 10 for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels so the woman is to cover her head with some sort of fabric when praying or prophesying and uh, you see here that women prophesy which is as though the Lord is speaking from them so they have huge value within the church they're not called to remain silent you know they do actually uh, pray and prophesy within the church and there's nothing wrong with that but here we see that we cover our head as a female because of the angels now what does that mean well I, I think that it means that uh, in the beginning you know the angels they some of them rebelled against God and that's where you get Satan from so Satan was originally an angel of light um, and, he, and he masquerades as an angel of light you know he gives the impression that he's pure and perfect and he gives us twisted truths and then we follow them and we end up in a dark path but he rebelled against God and um, as women are the lesser glory of man they're called to cover their head um, because of the angels and I think it's because you know if you remain with your head uncovered then really you're kind of rebelling against the Word of God and uh, rebellion is exactly what the angels did at the start so it's important for us to be able to be um, seen to be obedient to God now a female that doesn't cover her hair today <laughs> her head today with a fabric when she prays or prophesies you know I I think um, that it might be okay and I say might because the Word of God sees, says here that we should keep our head covered now if I was female because I love God and I know the scripture and I have revelation of truth I have to be honest that I would cover my head not by law but to please God so that's what I would call to do now do I as a husband told the wife to cover her head <laughs> it's a difficult question personally I don't but I do mention to my wife every now and then about this scripture and I don't make it as a point to try and you know make her do these things 
We live in a Western world and the culture here is that we don't cover our heads when we pray and prophesy as uh, females. But I do mention to my wife and I've discussed it with her that this scripture does exist and this is what it says. And um, I'm kind of leaving it to her because uh, I, you know, I love her. I give her the freedom to follow Christ and be obedient to him. And I believe that's what God does to us. He gives us scripture to follow. And really it's up to us whether we please him or not. And uh, that goes for the males as well as for females. So I don't force it upon my wife, but I do say that this is what the scripture says. Personally, I think that my wife looks beautiful when she has some sort of scarf over her head. She, um, we were walking through the um, through a field the other day, and it was really, really hot. And I was thinking to myself, she had a fabric over her head. I was thinking to myself, how lovely she looks like that. And it's not, um, you know, I'm not saying that she needs to do it by by law, but I'm just saying that women actually do look quite beautiful when they have a soft fabric over their head. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And the scripture does call us to pray and prophesy like that. Now, if you adopted that as a female, you know, that's up to you. Uh, but God bless you for following the scriptures. You know, I personally would do it with my whole heart. You know, um, if I was female, I would cover my head. Uh, but I'm not. So uh, I remain uncovered because I'm the glory of God. And you might hate all of this, but God is love. God is love, and he died for all of us, male or female. And I love my wife. I love my wife. She's amazing. Um, but there, are, there is scriptures, and it is what it is. And personally, I would follow them. It says in verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So, we're called to be together in the Lord, you know, through marriage, but uh, also, you know, know that women created man in the first place, so they have a huge value in themselves. So man wouldn't exist without the woman, and it, that is God's design. Verse 12, for as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are God. Amen. In verse 16, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom neither the churches of god so if you don't agree with these things if you don't agree with what's being said paul is saying here that we we have this custom this is the custom that we have and it's throughout the churches of god now i believe that the catholics have been a little bit guilty in the sense that they've taken tradition and made it an ultimate authority and it becomes a bit blurred because unfortunately we don't have a canon of um, of tradition but here we see a tradition that's been established by the apostles that's been moved out through the churches and really I think that it you know we as Protestants were kind of guilty of not following tradition as much as probably as what we should do you know and here we see a tradition that was available um, and I can see a lot of Protestants going like, <laughs> who, who do you think you are? Like, they're probably hating this. But I do think that we've lost something, really. We've lost our church history. We've lost our um, our traditions that, you know, we, we may have lost through, uh, unfortunately, time. I do believe that we have whatever we need that is revealed within Scripture. But this is revealed in Scripture, and it's certainly something that we should consider. But um, the Catholics, I think, that they're... they're they're guilty unfortunately of taking tradition too far in the sense that they just um, follow tradition as an authority and sometimes that authority can seem to override the word of God personally I think that this is the is the benchmark we should stick to this and if we see something that is against tradition then we should really follow the scriptures because isn't that what Jesus said to the Pharisees you know he said that they were guilty of following the traditions and teachings of man rather than the teachings of God but here we see in the Word of God which is inspired by God a tradition within the church that is something that we should definitely consider verse 20 when you come together therefore into one place this is not to eat the Lord's Supper and now this scripture can be a little bit confusing what it is saying is that you should eat the Lord's Supper but to be honest there was something wrong within the Corinthian church which 
is outlined for us here. It says in verse 23, um, sorry, it says in verse 21, For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunkard. So, yeah, have somebody drunk at the Lord's Supper who's taking a bit too much wine, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because some people say that wine wasn't alcoholic in the New Testament times, but here we see people getting drunk on wine, so there's something in that, isn't there? Uh, and we see people arriving with their own supper, you know, it's all there with their bread and wine ready to go. But then we see poor people that haven't got that. So they're not sharing, they're not communing together, and that is not the Lord's Supper. We need to ensure that everybody has the bread and wine. And it's easy in the church today because the bread and wine is given to you when you have communion. Personally, in our church, we tend to have communion every single Sunday, so uh, we enjoy that privilege, um, and we do it in remembrance of the Lord. Now, um, it says here then um, in verse 23, and when we have community communion, this is usually read out in our church. And I don't, I'm not saying our church is the best church ever, but what I am saying is that it is a nice piece of scripture to read out. So as we're preparing to take the bread and wine this is what's read out 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23 for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So we take the bread and we drink the wine in a communion um, in a in a communion supper to remember the body that Christ gave us on the cross. You know, he gave us his flesh, he died for us, but also the blood that was shed, which was the payment for our sin. It was the atonement for our sin. So that blood paid off all of our sin and in turn allowed Jesus' righteousness to be imputed to our lives so that we're considered holy within the church. So it is an amazing gift of God, especially when you come to the realization that Jesus is God. He's the Son of God, but he is God. And God dying on the cross for us is more than a sufficient payment to pay off all of our sin. So we take the bread and we drink the wine in remembrance of Jesus. It's to remember what he did for us until he comes again, which he will do in his, in his second coming. So very important scriptures. And it says in verse 27, and this is also read out in our church, Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. So we should examine our lives and understand that the body that we're eating and the blood that we're drinking, the wine that we're drinking, is really a symbolic, a symbolic representation of the sacrifice which God, Jesus, made for us on the cross so we can be set free from our sin. So when we take that bread and we drink that wine, it's that we can understand what sacrifice God gave for us. And when we're doing this, we're able to reflect on our lives and recognize um, the sacrifice that God did for us, but also reflect on, you know, if we've um, done anything wrong, this is an opportunity for us to um, to ask God for forgiveness and pray to him, um, which is a good thing to do when you have communion. And it's supposed to be done in order within the congregation um, as a kind of lovely meal to represent 
what God did for us and it reminds us until he comes again. God bless you. Thank you.